OK. So but have, yeah, just a few people in the room. So this is the, session, this is the session about owning and operating a pinball museum. And we have four guys with experience that are going to share their experiences and tell you about their museum. Uh, the first, uh, the fir I have only visited one of the four. And the first one is the Dutch Pinball Museum, owned and operated by Gerard van Sande. <laughs> it's in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, um, in one of the oldest areas of Rotterdam. Um, and it, and it's a in, a, in a location, in a building which is about 200 years old. Then we have the, the, the lovely and uh, talented Rob Burke, who's been running this thing for 39 years. Uh, about and the museum. The and how long have you been running the museum? Less than a year. Less than a year. So uh, you're never too experienced to try new things. And that's in, this is the weirdest. His name is Gerard, it's pronounced Gerard. And Rob opened his museum in Girard, Ohio. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we have Charlie Martin from the Seattle Pinball Museum, yeah. which opened in 2010, I just learned. And then David Alverson from Chattanooga. And his museum, let me get it right, it's called the Classic Arcade and Pinball Museum, correct? Right. Okay, located in Chattanooga. If you ever happen to be driving down to Florida and you need to stop, it's like halfway between here and exactly. there. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so I do have some questions for the panel. First, I would like uh, each of them to pick up their microphone, uh, talk about how they, well, we'll start with Gerard. How did you get into, uh, well, I know that you started as a house painter, and I know that you rented pinball machines to corporate events in the Netherlands because I rented one from, well, what a co the company I worked for rented a p pinball machine from Gerard, which is how I met you 12 years ago or so. And now you have the number one museum in Rotterdam. N not just pinball. So okay, explain your background. Yes, uh, if you mind if I stand up, I uh, more feel comfortable when I'm standing up and I have a better overview. Uh, hello, I am Gerard. It's very confusing for you. Uh, you cannot say Gerard. It's very uh, Rob visited us uh, on and off year, two years ago. And I think he got inspired and said, I'm going to find a place that's called Gerard <laughs> and I'm going to open my museum. Uh, short uh, story, I'm 49 years old. I've been passionate about pinball all my life. And I wanted to start a museum uh, uh, many years ago, many years before I started the museum. Uh, 2014, it was time. Uh, I went to visit Charlie in Seattle and that gave me a little seat. And I want to start the museum. And now it's enormous, it's huge. Uh, we got 4,000 square meters filled with it. And Americans always said, how many machines, how many machines? It's not important. We had a lot of machines. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. We got 100 pinball machines playable in pristine condition. And it's, 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 it's doable, but if we want to grow to 200, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it, keep it, keep it small. Uh, but yep. uh, actually we do a lot about education, a lot. And I always uh, say, if you are a museum, you have to act like a museum, be a museum, do something, education, whatever. Yeah, don't put. Oh no, I'm not. <laughs> Sorry, no, I don't want to be a uh, uh, smartass. But um, <laughs> we're doing fine. Um, uh, I always say, uh, I was a house house painter, and uh, I always said, if there is a job offer for being a CEO of a pinball museum with my education, I won't get it. But passion is not for sale. And I always say, we do this because uh, it's not because it's easy. We do it because we thought it was be easy. It was easy. So there's something different. And uh, we do it now for almost nine years. And uh, every year it's grow and grow. And I want to show you some pictures that you have an idea what I'm talking about. Um, Martin, can you open the second photo first? Oh, oh. We are in a neighborhood uh, in Dells Haven. Uh, funny story, uh, the building is uh, 200 years old, but 400 years ago, uh, you did fact check. Uh, I did. Yeah. If, if you can have the slow person look towards the United States. We all know the pil pilgrims arrived on a Mayflower to, to where was it? What rock? Plymouth Rock. <laughs> Got it. Yay, remember it now. Well, before they left, they left England and they first went to Leida in the Netherlands. And a bunch of them went down to Delshaven, got on a boat called the Speedwell in 1640. 
it met up with the Mayflower, and they were going to come to this into America together. They were, they were fleeing, uh, yeah, religious persecution, as we all know, as people that studied very much civics in school. Um, the speedwell sunk, the one that came from Holland, and everybody got in the Mayflower, and then they proceeded. But so it was, yeah, in 1640, it sailed from pretty much right in front of the Pinball Museum in Rotterdam, which is kind of cool for Americans. So, uh, the Americans took pinball to the Netherlands, and we bring it back to where it started. So that's a nice, uh, <laughs> that's a nice one. Uh, the building is very iconic. It's uh, one of the uh, the largest. Uh, it's the largest building in the in this uh, area. Um, and uh, let's go uh, to the next photo. So I will explain what we are seeing. Just left and right is where. The <laughs> I never worked with so. what? Uh, Which one do you want me on that one? No, that's it's okay. the next one is okay. Next one, great, great. Yeah. So this is our historian room. Uh, the thing in the middle, it's an, uh, a French game. It's called Tupi Hollandaise. Uh, it's from 1853. It's an uh, ancestor to pinball. And in the background, we do timelines, stuff like that. This is the area where you cannot play. We got like a knockout, the pristine condition. Uh, we got Humpty Dumpty. We got a lot of classics uh, that the people can show. They, ca they cannot play it. And if someone's really enthusiastic, I will let them play, but it's not for the, the main uh, visitors because it's too much, and I want to keep them in pristine condition. Okay. Uh, our uh, wall, the war on pinball, uh, said do something about education. We could fill this wall completely with new sterns. It's possible, but the iconic uh, building, uh, uh, I said I'm going to tell the war on pinball story because it's a nice, the Roger Sharp story, etc. And uh, these bagatelles, these pre-war games that you see, if you show them flat, you walk around it, and yeah, it's nice. Uh, but I choose uh, them to uh, present them like this. It's not playable anymore, but it's fucking, it rocks. It's uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't say fuck here, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> we none of us can. Uh, the, the boxes that you can see on the underneath, it's uh, uh, educational boxes. You, uh, you see how it works with uh, sounds or reels or flippers or pop flippers. And in the glass boxes, we get the chance to buy a lot of original molds from the factory from Bali and Williams. Uh, the mold in the right corner uh, downstairs, it's a damsel ramp mold. You can, if you want to make a ramp, you have to have a mold. If you want to make a toy, you have to have a mold. And we got a lot of original molds. Uh, and we have a lot of them, and we present them well. Maybe we can see the next picture. This is the Rudy mold. Uh, Rudy game is mil built, uh, I don't know, specific, 13,000 times <laughs> or so. And you need a set of molds to make those uh, iconic heads. And yeah. I think this is uh, something I always said people, what are you most proud of? What is your most expensive game? Whatever. And I always say, if there's a fire and I have to only one minute to get something out, I pick these items. Yeah, because this is never going to uh, be uh, produced again. And pinball is a pinball, and I love them. But if I had the chance, I will grab this stuff. Uh, one of our rooms uh, do a lot about uh, decoration, the, the old bins on the wall and the play fields. I got about 160 play fields in nice condition to decorate the place. I like big objects, uh, statues, uh, like for instance, if there's a cactus canyon, there's a canyon next to them. If there's an I Indiana Jones, Indiana Jones is looking at him in the real life. Uh, something we're building now in dinosaur room with all dinosaur themes, big dinosaurs and stuff like that. Uh, the new lineup, uh, the Stern, um, we inside the Connect, you all know that. Uh, like for instance, in the month of uh, August, it was uh, rainy weather in the Netherlands and everybody, if it's raining, it's crowded. And we got like 7,000 inside the Connect hits in a month. And that is a lot. Uh, also, you see uh, at the right side, see Groot. Groot is a character from, uh, from the movie and the, the machine is next to it. And it's an expensive statue, and uh, you can easily buy another pinball machine, but that's another pinball machine. Yeah. Uh, like I said, uh, timeline. It's in Dutch because we are the Dutch Pinball Museum. Yeah, think about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so people will say, hey, what is it in English? Yeah, okay, do something. It's educational. We can try to learn. It. Keep all your apps and translate the dinger. We're working on QR <laughs> codes. So yeah. <laughs> she she lives in the Netherlands. She tries to get Dutch words. Uh, she <laughs> won't laugh at it. Uh, yeah. So um, and back again at the at the end. So uh, if you ever want to visit Rotterdam, 
join me. I got a lot of keychains. Afterwards, grab one, uh, scan it. You know where we are. And I'm happy to uh, uh, share my enthusiastic about pinball. And uh, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little after note, and you can, you can fact check me on this. If you Google best museums in Rotterdam, you, the top five are the following. The Maritime Museum, which is relevant because there's a giant port in Rotterdam, which was bombed um, during the Second World War, which is really cosmopolitan and high tech. That's number five. Number four, which cracks me up, is Kijk Kubis. That means, <laughs> well, you, those guys from that row can, <laughs> can translate it, but it's kind of an art museum, <laughs> more or less. Number three is uh, another art museum, the Kunsthal. Number two is the Museum of Boymans van Brüningen, and this is from TripAdvisor. And that one they're putting how much into the redo? Going up to 180 million. Yeah, just 180 million. So it's closed for restoration. Yeah. But the number one, and this is not even from Pinheads, is the Dutch Pinball Museum. So that's quite neat. And then <laughs> TripAdvisor. Now, Rob, tell us your story. So my story is an interesting story. First of all, I, I was able to go to the Dutch Pinball Museum, and uh, what he didn't mention about it is that even the showcase, when you, when you leave, there's great little op opportunities to buy some souvenirs there of your place, but um, it is indeed the educational, which I, I also enjoyed very much. And uh, it helped inspire me uh, to a bit. Either, you know, the thing is, when you have so many games that I did, I had over 1,000 games in the collection, and when you get that many games, what are you going to do with them? How often do you look at them? How often do you play them? You don't. They just sit there collecting dust. So uh, there was a grocery store in our, in our neighborhood that uh, went up for sale, a 30,000 square foot grocery store. And I said, hmm, what if I could buy that building? And I bought the building. And then, hmm, I wonder what it's going to cost to uh, fix it up. Well, you don't want to know that answer. But also, you don't want to know how long it took to fix it up. I mean, we're talking years. It was just, you know, just a lot of work. And we finally got there, and uh, we have over 600 games operating. And uh, unlike other museums, all the games are clean. They're all in line. They all work. And occasionally you have two or three that don't. But we, we have a myriad of games going from the 30s, showing the early history like you do as well, up to the, to the newest games. But the one thing I like to specialize in is games you see in my museum that you don't see anywhere else, and that is uh, I have a, a tremendous amount of games from Italy and Spain. So you never see their games in America anyways. So people that come to, to the museum are, are really intrigued by all these crazy titles. And they're a little bit on the raunchy side as far as the artwork, but that's part of the European culture. So the other thing we've done is, um, as far as the historical uh, uh, and, uh, instructional part of the museum is we have banners that, that are suspended and um, about 30 banners are of the superstars in the industry whether it be starting with uh, David Gottlieb and um, all the people that were part of the early history of the PIM, of the industry as well as the, the new designers and artists so their pictures appear as well as a little history about them and then we have uh, another area which we just mentioned and have pictures of, of the games that were uh, instrumental in making changes in the industry, whether it be a Gorgar, the first talking game, whether it be a picture of Roger Sharp and what he did. So all these things are in the museum, and um, it's an educational experience, but most people are there just to play the games and lose their mind. We charge $20 to get in, and you can play until you drop. And we're, we're open Thursday through Sunday. But uh, we find, of course, the weekends are the busiest, at least in, in for us in America. Recently, we brought a little bit of food smattering, but people so far have come from all over the U.S. in the short time we've been in business, which is intriguing. No one from Europe that I can recall yet, although Ivan came here from Italy on the way to Expo, he stopped by to see us. Roland came from Germany. Thank you, sir. Danke That's all I can tell you. And uh, it was just great to see them show up and, and, uh, and, and see it. I've been to Charlie's Museum. I've been to Dave's. I've been to all of them. So the one thing you'll find is every museum has got its own flavor, distinct flavor and style. So that's why you have to visit them all. Charlie? Can, can I just ask one quick question, Rob? Are you the closest museum um, in, in proximity to Chicago? Uh, I don't know about that. We are, uh, what, seven hours? Or so, so it, it's a, 
Okay. This, this young man's been there. How far we drive? You know what we should do for Pinball Expo next year? We'll have a bus. Oh, First of all, the go. bus takes you to New York City. You fly to you fly to <laughs> Europe, see your place, spend a day there, eat, and then <laughs> come back to Chicago and just have a bu one big bus trip. It'll be the first. Yeah, it'll be the first two-week expo. So, Charlie, you're a little too far to drive to. So you'd have to, unless you really like the person you're in the car with. Um, so, Seattle, tell us how you started in 2010. Well, first off, I want to uh, express my thanks to Rob for the opportunity, and I want to introduce my better half, my wife, Cindy. Aww. Without her, I wouldn't be here, and without her, there would be no Seattle Pinball Museum. So that out of the way, hi, I'm Charlie. I'm a pinball addict. We all are. Uh, addict or junkie? It's the same thing, right? At, well, yeah. You know, potato, potato, right? So my pinball journey started in 2008. We decided that network TV after dinner was terrible. So he said, we should get a pinball machine. Like, what are you going to do with that? I'm going to put it in the garage, and after we eat and debrief, we're going to play pinball with the dog. We're going to smoke cigars. We're going to sip a little whiskey. And we're going to enjoy some of the finer things in life instead of Oprah or Dr. Phil. So we bought one. <laughs> and then there was another one. And then one broke. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to buy another one. What? <laughs> what are you going to do with another one? Well, I'm going to play that till I figure out how to fix the first one. And the next thing you know, the living room's full. The garage is full. You guys that haven't bought a machine, your first one, very, very slippery slope. So then we had too many, and he started thinking, what are we going to do? We're not going to quit buying these things. They're too cool to ignore. So I reached out to some friends and said, hey, we should all throw in a couple hundred bucks, and we'll rent a warehouse or a garage or something, and we'll have our own clubhouse on Friday nights, Saturday nights. We could you know, trade games, teach each other how to work on them, have fun, and share our love of these, you know, wonderful machines. So then, 2009, everybody knows what happened to the economy, right? So we found a program in Seattle called Storefront Seattle that was designed to bring economic rebirth to downtrodden areas. So we started looking around, and we applied to the program, and there were 110 applicants, and they picked 11. And they called me up one day and said, when can you pick up the keys? They said, what? I said, yeah, you pick up the keys today. you got to be open next Friday. And he gave us like seven days. He said, and the mayor's coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we had, at that point, we had like three presentable working games. So I called my friends in the area and said, what do you got that we can use? And... The way our friends responded, <laughs> everybody said, we got games, we got you. So we put it together, and uh, people liked it. So we had three months free rent. We did that, and Cindy and I were both working full-time jobs. We had some volunteers. And after three months, we thought, people are keep coming. Either they're crazy or they like what we're doing. So we asked the program, and it's like, can you give us another three months so we can fine tune this? Now, this is in 2010. Okay, and they said, yeah, we think so. So we did that, and at the end of the second three months, figured we can make this work. We love meeting all the people and, and showing them the games and sharing our passion. And that's really one of the things that we love to do is share our passion for these wonderful machines. So we negotiated. And we cut a good deal, and, you know, things rolled and rolled, and more people kept coming, and more people kept coming, and uh, we brought on some more help. And the next thing you know, 
You know, things are great. And then in 2020, a little thing called COVID came along. And they shut us down. The government said, you guys can't be doing this anymore because we don't want all these people going through all these, you know, businesses in small spaces and spreading this horrible, you know, ailment. So for 16 months, we thought, what are we going to do? Do we pull the plug or do we just turn the cheek and, you know, retool? And that's what we did. So in 2022, July, 2021 in July, we're back, okay? And prior to that, we kind of focused on let's get the best of the best of the best. So we had, you know, five or six games from 92, five or six games from 93, and I thought, you know, we should kind of return to our roots. And so the idea was we're going to have one game for every year that we can from 1960 to 2022 then. And so we're pulling out, you know, Theater of Magics and Whitewaters are going going away and all these great games. But the, the vision was if you're going to be a museum, you got to show everything, whether people like that game or not. It's part of the past. So that's what we've uh, been focusing on lately. Uh, we're very, very happy that people like what we're doing. And uh, we have people from 7 to 97 that come in. And our passion is really, it's, it's a little bit different than everybody else's. We suck people in and rub that passion off on them and say, let's go over here and play this game. And to see the smile on people's faces when they get a multi-ball or they get a high score or they go, I just heard a, what's that? That means you just want a free game. And a lot of people don't know about knockers. And to see them light up and go, oh, I got the high score, I got the high score. Or to see a kid ask his dad, teach me how to play this. And the dad will tell the kid, your mom and I played this when we were in college. And the kid will say, teach me how to play it so I can beat mom. <laughs> it, it just, it, it really, you know, that's what makes it special for us. So, you know, there's a lot of places to play pinball in Seattle. We're the only all ages, all the time uh, venue. We got uh, pinball machines from 1960 to 2023. And we've got little cards on them, a little trick, you know, that we borrowed from the Pacific Pinball Museum back in the day. But uh, our educational is, is more on a, hey, tell me about this, or why does this do that? And we just say, well, we explain it. The staff has been trained to explain how it works, and we feel that that one-on-one -on -one is really our best method of passing along the education, and, w and we get to rub some of that passion off on them. So where do we go from here? Okay. We believe the future of this passion we all share is in bringing in the new people. We have to have new people coming in. And it's, it's kind of like crop rotation. You know, you plant potatoes one year, you do beans, you always got to be looking ahead. So our focus is bringing in those 7, 8, 10, 12-year-olds, even 16-year-olds, and introducing them to pinball addiction. And it's easy. It's real easy. And that's, that's kind of what we do. And as uh, venue operators, and, and Rob's doing a wonderful job with Expo because we saw some kids coming in. We saw an elderly gentleman snoozing in the chair waiting to go in. And you got to hit all of those groups because no one group should be ignored. They're all equally important. They all do it for different things, but our future is making sure that no one is left out of the pinball culture. Thank you. I guess, I guess, I guess you don't miss the last 15 years of Oprah and Dr. Phil, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Dr. Phil used to say, how's that working out yeah, for you?
Well, pinball has worked out very well for us. We love what we do, and uh, I'm very proud and honored to be here. Okay, thank you very much. Dave. <laughs> Dave from Chattanooga. Give us your, give us your, how you decided to open a museum. And, and, and maybe just one quick question I haven't a been able to ask the panel yet. How did you get, how are you qualified to be a museum instead of an arcade? Well, that's actually a great question, and I don't know that there's any particular qualification that I would say, but uh, I think a lot of those points have already been hit by some of the other panelists here, Rob and uh, Gerard and Charlie. Um, the, m the main thing that distinguishes the museum from the arcade is that we're really trying to show the history of pinball and the entire you know, development of pinball through the years. Um, so we do that by like Charlie mentioned, not necessarily just having the most popular games, but we pick games that have unique features, maybe like, you know, the first with uh, Flippers was Humpty Dumpty, the first with Speech was Gorgar, you know, mul first multiball, these types of things, so that we can distinguish those, and we have little information placards on each game cool. that explains that. This, this game's here because it's got this feature, this was the first, first game to, to have that. And I, I should probably introduce myself. I didn't do that. Um, LJ did. My name's <laughs> Dave Alverson. And I, actually, I have a probably a very common history uh, story is how I got started in pinball uh, to a lot of other people, too. Um, when I was young, my father used to bowl in a bowling league. And uh, <clears throat> when he would go to the bowling alley, he'd give me some quarters, and I'd go over to the arcade and play pinball machines while he was bowling because that was what was interesting to me. That was the late 70s. Um, I started tinkering around with electronics and just curiosity of how things worked uh, as a teenager. And the first job I had out of high school was a technician at an arcade in, in the local mall. And I was, I was working on games and keeping games up and running. That was the early 80s, um, which was significant in that pinball was kind of in a little bit of a decline then. And video arcades were really the, the, you know, the king of the arcades at that point. Um, but that, that arcade did have about four or five pinballs in the back. I always loved pinball. Um, <clears throat> and later in my career, I continued on working on other electronics, consumer electronics and such. Eventually got an engineering degree, went into product development for a couple of large companies, you know, working a corporate job for, for many years. Um, and it was the spring of 2018 uh, I took my family, I have a, a young son, I took him to Asheville, North Carolina, which is a small town kind of similar in size to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, we were uh, just walking around downtown Asheville and there was an Asheville Pinball Museum. I'd really honestly kind of forgotten about pinball over the years. I mean, that happens, you get a career and a family. And, um, <clears throat> but we went inside the Asheville Pinball Museum. They had a waiting list to get in, it was packed. I, you know, all these memories of playing pinball just came back immediately. I saw all these games I used to play when I was a kid. I was fascinated. My son had never seen a pinball game in his life. Um, so, you know, I'm showing him how to play. We just had a blast. And, and I'm walking around Asheville as we came out of the pinball museum, and I'm seeing that it has a really similar feel to downtown Chattanooga, which was my hometown. Um, and... That was kind of the inspiration right there. I said, you know, if this is this successful in Asheville and this city is similar to Chattanooga, I should be able to do the same type of thing in Chattanooga. And, th and that's what started the whole ball rolling. Um, and, and, you know, all of this comes with a few lucky breaks here and there, too. Um, part of it was uh, I think that same summer I went to the first uh, pinball show that I had ever gone to which was Southern Fried in Atlanta that was just because it was close in proximity and I happened to meet uh, a gentleman there by the name of Stephen Gentry he's in the back of the, the room here tonight um, and he had a pinball machine for sale and that was the first pinball machine that I bought and, and I told him I was planning to open a pinball museum in Chattanooga. And I, I, he looked at me like I was absolutely crazy. And, and he's probably right. You've heard the saying, you know, uh, you don't have to be crazy to work here, but it helps. It pro probably applies to opening a, a pinball location, too. Um, you don't have to be crazy. probably helps a little bit. Um, but that was the start of it. And Stephen had collected, had a large collection at home of some really 
unique and oddball games that you don't see very often, which was exactly what I needed to get started. Um, and he was generous enough to sell me quite a large number of machines out of his collection. Um, and I went looking around. Um, I, I will say that um, my museum is probably the smallest of the ones that are represented here. We have a little over 50 games out on the floor. Um, that's about perfectly sized for the town that we're in. So if you were ever considering opening a place like this, you know, first and foremost, you've got to have an idea of what you're doing, who your customer is, what the market is. So I knew Chattanooga is a, a small to mid-sized town. It's not going to support uh, uh, a location that's got, you know, 200 machines. It's just, there's just not that many people there. Um, but we are in a very tourist uh, district in the downtown Chattanooga area, so we get a lot of tourists that are walking around and they see the place and probably have the very same experience that I had w when I found the, the uh, pinball museum in Asheville, North Carolina. Hey, look, a pinball museum. I haven't played pinball in years. And as Charlie was mentioning, you know, one of the things that's really important here is, you know, you've got to be able to attract families. You want to get multi-generations coming in the door. You know, the, the older people that played pinball when they were younger, they're going to remember it, they're going to come back, but to keep it going, to keep it alive, you've really got to introduce this to the younger generation because they have not seen it. It wasn't available to them when they were growing up. There weren't places to go play. Um, so you get all these people coming in that are just, you know, maybe looking for something fun to do for the afternoon. A few of the younger kids are probably going to get hooked on pinball and become pinball nuts just like the rest of us. And, and that that seed, planting that seed and, you know, sparking that interest is, is what's going to keep this going for, for years to come. Um, but we're, we're, we strive to do some of the things, same things that Dutch Pinball Museum has done, you know, have some exhibits and some interesting artifacts around. Um, we've got stories, you know, uh, pictures of stories on the walls about the history of pinball and some of the people who developed unique features. Um, Roger Sharp, I saw him in the back of the room earlier. Um, we've got a, a few little uh, photographs and the story of, of, you know, his contribution to pinball. And I will say, um, yesterday I was out on the floor and I saw Roger and his son and his grandson, they were all out playing and I thought that was absolutely fantastic. Three generations of Sharps here, here playing pinball, which is just, just great. Um. Do we have time for Q&A or how are we doing on time? I hear. Is the signing session coming afterwards? Is that yeah. <laughs> okay, the noise you're hearing is the people signing memorabilia or things, right? So do we have any time for questions, or is there another session? Yeah, we'll make one real quick. I, I, w I would like to add something just before I, I finish up here. Oh, An another key component of this is building the right staff for your museum. So I was really lucky, and I found some, some great people. Uh, Logan Lee is my general manager. He's here in the audience tonight. He is absolutely passionate about pinball, and he's fantastic about with customer service and those are the two most important things I think you've got to have a staff that loves pinball and that is really outgoing and friendly to the public because people are going to come in and ask questions and that's who you want to represent you you want them explaining and, and, and those people will see that passion and if you look up on Chattanooga on TripAdvisor we're also the number one museum Yay. in Chattanooga Tennessee right. based on Yay. the views and, so we and just and all, all of that is thanks to our, our fantastic staff. I mean, they're the, they're the ones that really. Okay, so Dave's takeaway is you got to have good people, and that's <laughs> that excellent. Exactly, yes. Is there, a t is there a takeaway that you'd like to share, Gerard? That or, or let's go back this way, maybe. So if there's one thing, one piece of advice you could give anybody who's interested in starting a museum, besides getting, got, is it Logan is his name? Logan Lee. Logan Lee. Besides, Logan besides stealing Logan Lee. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. So you can't you can't have him, but what you, you got to find your own good staff. Um, <laughs> Charlie, what would you have to say if you could give one good takeaway for the group? For anybody that uh, thinks that it's easy, it's not, but it's so rewarding that when you see those kids with the smile on their face, live your dream, do it the best you can. Everything else takes care of itself. Okay. Well, you got me. <laughs> Rob. Dave, you beat me to the punch. Um, 
I was going to say, in, in my case, um, I always try to find the best people, like yourself, like we all do, in, in certain uh, job applications. And uh, in my, ki my case, I find a gentleman by the name of Mike Hale. And Mike is, is special in that he's a big social uh, media guru, lover, and he's he has a great following from that. In fact, a lot of people have come here and say, hey, hi, Rob. Hey, where's Mike? And they say, hi, Mike Hale. So he's got a great following, but between Mike and his his uh, cohort, uh, Patrick, uh, they've helped keep everything going. And, and you are correct. Behind any good business, successful business, is you have a, a team that believes in, in the dream. And sometimes Mike Hale gets mad at me, but he says, you know what, but I'm uh, – I'm here to make what put your dream into reality, which he has done so. So I love you, man. Aww. Hey, one other thing um, I think which makes makes each of us special, and I think is attraction, is having a special game or two, which is unique. So you know, you can go to the, the nearest uh, arcades and find the nearest the latest Stern games. But like you know, I try to find the biz the bizarre games and the unique games. And in my case, I'm, I just purchased a Stern game that very few of you ever heard of called Cosmic Princess. And it was a game made uniquely for the Australian market. So that'll be in my museum next year. Get ready, Mike. <laughs> Can I guess yours, your Wednesday night trick? Is that your secret or not? Uh, our Wednesday night is our volunteer evening. <laughs> and without those guys, uh, uh, we couldn't exist. So uh, it, it indeed... Uh, yeah, uh, funny joke, uh, that's funny joke, funny story. Uh, Wednesday night is our uh, evening that we get together and we work on the machines and there's a bar next door. And uh, if it's 10 o'clock, say, come to the guys, uh, we're gonna grab a beer. We also have beer, but it's funny to sit in the uh, in in area. And we all wear the same shirts. And last time uh, we went in and the bartender said, all the all, all autistic? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. They you don't have free. to, but it helps. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's uh, there aren't. But it's it's for for an, for an outstander, it's hard to to understand that you have the same passion. Look at those around over there, those guys. It's all Dutch, and we have a great time here. And if you if actually if you want to start a museum, look at your agenda. If it's empty for the next five years, do it. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> don't don't start it. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. As, oh, sorry, questions. I'm sorry, I didn't. Are you ready for questions? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, you please. Okay, okay th yeah, three. We're, we're way over. Oh, sorry, we're way over. Three questions. Three questions, sorry. Okay. Uh, you spoke about Colorado over the years. You were successful in Colorado over the years, but I know some of the guys have told us. What are the pitfalls you want people to stay away from? I would say the most important thing is to understand the market and the customer that you're, you, the location where you're going to open. Um, you may have an idea of what you want to do for your 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 business, but if if your customers don't relate to that, if if you're not attracting the right customers and getting the people in the door, the business isn't going to succeed. So it's not just what you want, but you have to understand what your customers want. So for, for my location, I knew that I needed to be in a, in a tourist area with a lot of high traffic because Chattanooga is a smaller town. I was not going to attract a lot of local people to come in and play, but I could rely on the, the tourism industry there. And, and so that worked really well for me. Um, but that means I tailor my business a little bit different to, to work for those people. Um, so I, I specifically did not want to look like a barcade I do serve beer, but I don't have a bunch of beer signs hanging in the window because I want it to be very family friendly because tourists are, are families and they're looking for fun, safe places to bring their kids. So understand who your customer is going to be before you ever start. Design something that's going to work for them. I mean, still, if your passion is pinball, obviously it's going to be pinball is what you're presenting to them. But you've got to do it in, in a way that is they want to. They want to enjoy it, so that that would be my best suggestion. And as far as uh, uh, Rob was talking about, it, everything's going to cost at least twice, if not three times, what you expect it to be, and it's going to take two to three times longer than you think when when you start out, because there's a lot you're not going to know. Um, so you know you have to be able to, to roll with those. Um, and 
you know, we opened one year before COVID hit. We were shut down also, but only for about three months. But that was a, a pretty scary time. When they first shut us down, we thought it was only going to be for a couple of weeks. Um, it ended up being about three months. Fortunately, you know, the government stepped in with the PPP loans and some other things that kind of helped us through. And because we had just started, I was still being pretty conservative as far as not spending too much money and not getting too deep in debt. So that allowed me to ride out that, that pretty much a year of really poor, you know, business. Um, Are there any, any other, qu other questions? Any other questions? Because we're a bit over time, I guess. Oh, oh Rob's got One an more answer. quick Wait, little a an anecdote. <laughs> there is another thing we offer at our museum, which you don't see too often, but we have one row of gun games. Oh. I got 25 different titles. Can you imagine that? Wow. Only a wild man would do that. <laughs> but... Uh, Years and years of looking for this stuff, but that's also an attraction. You'd be surprised at young and old ages that want to play those gun games. That's it, guys? Thank yeah, thank you.